Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Career Invincibility Show. I'm your host, Christine Paracas, and I cannot tell you how excited I am for our next guest. She has so much to share with us that I am going to bring her back. This isn't the last time that we get to hear from our guest today. And this is something so near and dear to my heart, but also a bit of a pivot from some of the conversations we've been having about career and business and, you know, that kind of um, the doings of the outside world and how we interact. And I wanted to gift to you today this wonderful guest that we have. Our guest today is Maya Rizkala, who has been um, well, she comes from Lebanon. She's been through a civil war as a child in her native country. She's got a graphics um, degree and has been for the last 13 years a full-time volunteer with the Isha Foundation as a yoga instructor. And it's just an extraordinary thing. I've seen her command rooms of thousands of people and do that with such quiet uh well, I'll call it invincibility because we're on the career invincibility show, but it's there's a power in her that belies her uh, stature, her petite stature and calm voice. And it's just a wonderful thing to see. And I can't wait for, to introduce you to Maya. Maya Rizkala from the Isha Foundation. Welcome. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> and thank you for having me here today. Oh, I'm so pleased. So tell us a bit about yourself and your journey, because, you know, one of the things that happens on this show is that I get to bring on amazingly successful people and they're at the you know, other side of perhaps some journey that has gotten them there. And, and a lot of people will see that and think, oh, I could, that's very admirable, but it could never be me. And um, but all of us have a story that got us to where we are. So if you don't mind sharing a bit about yours. Sure, Christine. I'll I'll try to make it as short as possible. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> that time. <laughs> so, uh, as you mentioned, Christine, I was born uh, in Beirut, in Lebanon, uh, in 1983, and you know, born and brought up there. Uh, and as you mentioned, it was uh, I was born in the middle of the civil war. So basically, as a child, uh, civil war is all that I knew. So uh, it, they were very extreme circumstances. But you know, since we didn't know any better. I don't think we were expecting any better anyway. Um, I don't know how much you know you know about the civil war in Beirut. It was like literally uh, snipers on the roofs and the bombs flying all over the street. It's not like a bomb that, that uh, it's not a war that's conducted on a different territory. It's a war just next door to your house. So th there were pretty extreme circumstances where I really could see you know my mother and my father struggling to keep us afloat. We were three children, so I'm the youngest. Um, and uh, these were the first uh, nine years of my life. So the war ended in 1992. And of course, you know, in between, we would manage to go to school on and off. Um, but somehow we all managed to complete our primary education on time and college education on time. And um, so first nine years of my life were pretty traumatic, I would say, but, you know, it's only now comparing them to normal life that I can call them traumatic, but I really uh, see that as a human being, you could adapt to about anything, and we were pretty adapted to, <laughs> to, uh, uh, to life at that time, and, uh, you know, after the war ended anyway, it was uh, <laughs> such a beautiful situation. Compared to war, anything is wonderful. Uh, just having tap water is, <laughs> is like a miracle. So uh, I was brought up and raised again in Beirut. And then um, at the age of 18, I enrolled in the American University in Beirut for a degree in graphic design. And um, I lost my father after the Civil War at the age of 13. Uh, so that was, again, you know, uh, quite a big shock as a, a young teenager. And um, I remember that when I enrolled uh, in college, by this third year of college, this is when my sister, uh, who was who had just graduated with a degree in architecture, she's my older sister, and I've kind of listened to whatever she says. <laughs> That's the relationship <laughs> we have. So she came and she wouldn't stop talking about um, a certain person uh, that her colleague had told her about. Uh, she would refer to him as Jaggi at that time. And she would constantly be quoting him. Jaggi said this, Jaggi said that, and he's a phenomenal man, and he's an amazing man, and you have to listen to him. And, you know, she would only bring them from a third party uh, 
conversation. She would just hear it through someone and bring it back to us. And the next thing I know is uh, that the, um, as soon as she graduated, she went to India and she attended an uh, eight-day yoga program and came back completely transformed. So my sister at that time, you know, she was like the perfect party girl. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, she would be out every night uh, uh, dancing and, you know, of course, the youth in Lebanon, it's all, uh, you know, the whole uh, clubbing and, uh, you know, it's and the, the drinking Paris of the Middle of East, that. right? It's the Paris of the Middle East, it's the party city <laughs> of the yeah. Middle East, we party even in the middle of the war. And uh, when I saw her come back, you know, something had changed in her. Suddenly she was uh, sitting and doing some breathing exercises that I knew nothing about. But I was kind of drawn to it, uh, even though I was never drawn to anything called yoga or spirituality or anything like that. So even growing up, we grew up as a very um, liberal family, like uh, even though we were uh, born Catholics, but we were not, uh, you know, strict Catholics as such. My father always had a certain openness about religion and acceptance to everybody else's religion. And we grew in West Beirut, which is known to be the uh, Muslim side of the city. So there was never, you know, any kind of discrimination in our mind with regards to religion or anything like that. And there was no particular religious inclination or spiritual inclination as such. And then one day she she came. She was completely excited. She said, uh, "He's coming to Beirut. You have to go. To, you have to go and see him." And she wouldn't shut up. And <laughs> and I was in my third year of a graphic design degree, where uh, it was literally like sleepless nights and preparing for our um, final year proposal and all of that. But just to keep her quiet, I said, "Fine, I'll go and listen to him." He was giving a call in the uh, a talk in the UNESCO Palace in Beirut. And I had no idea what to expect. I just, I'm just going to listen to someone speak. And up until then, the only people I would listen to speak were my teachers, and I would be asleep half of the time in the classroom. <laughs> so, uh, so I went there, and uh, you know, the moment he started speaking, the the every single thing that he was addressing, it just hit me so hard because these were my my own questions. So even though there were 500 people in the room, it felt like he was talking to me personally. And I will just give an example because up until now, this has hit me in a very, very big way. And it hits me every time we mention, uh, you know, uh, I hear Sadhguru speak about this aspect. So um, one thing that he said during the talk is that... Um, no matter what you get in life, it will never be sufficient because uh, there is uh, something within us which is longing for more. And it just reminded me that when I was six years of age, I got extremely sick in the middle of the war. And then I had to go every single day to the hospital and get blood tests done. And because it was a very difficult situation, every time I would go for a blood test, my father would buy me a gift. And then it just after maybe four or five times where I would really be looking forward to the next gift I was going to get, the moment, so when the gift was in the window of the shop, it felt so magical and so wonderful. And then the moment it arrived to my hands, it felt like nothing. So when I heard Sadhguru speak about this in the talk, it hit me really hard because at a very young age, when, when I was six, it really hit me that uh, whatever I get, it will never be sufficient. And it kind of put me at a very, in a very puzzled situation as a very young child. And I learned to dismiss it growing up. So here he was bringing all my questions, all my burning questions back to the surface without giving an explicit answer to them, but just kind of uh, giving me a, like a burning need to find the answer to these questions myself. And one of the, the main questions was like, what am I doing here and what's next? Uh, am I just going to you know, graduate from college, grow up, find a job, wake up in the morning, breakfast, job, home, come back, sleep, and then will it continue like this forever? I, I, I didn't want to live like that. This is not the life that I wanted. So the person who was speaking that, Sadhguru, that uh, my sister was referring to as Jaggi was, you know, um, Sadhguru, who is the founder of Isha Foundation, uh, the foundation I'm involved with and whom I've been volunteering with for the last 13 years. So after the talk, I left completely uh, like dazed <laughs> it's just like I, I don't know I've never been impressed by anybody speaking but 
there he was, he was every single thing that he was saying, even though I wanted to question it, because this is how we were trained, that to question everything that was said to us, I couldn't find a loophole in anything that he was saying, because everything that he was saying was questions that I had. And then after that talk, which was a free introductory talk, there was a two-day program with him. And I attended the program. And when the program was over, you know, I was in a state of, uh, on one hand, there was a lot of confusion because all the, you know, all the building blocks I had, I had kind of built around myself all these years were being questioned. But on another hand, there was a huge sense of relief that I had found something that I was looking for for a very, very long time, and I couldn't put my finger on it. But there was this profound sense of relief. And after that, I just, you know, in the program, we learned a simple practice, which involved a breathing technique. It was a meditative practice, which I had never done before. And even when I asked my sister, what are you doing? She told me, it's unlike anything you've done before. You just have to go and, and experiment with it. And the only thing I did is keep up this practice on a daily basis. And uh, I shouldn't be too proud saying this, but at the age of 21, I was a heavy smoker. You know, In Lebanon, everybody smokes from the age of 17, so it's pretty standard there. And though I had been smoking for two years, um, within three weeks of doing the practice, I couldn't even smell a cigarette anymore. I couldn't even get it near my system. And this was an indication that there was something internally that was cleansing beyond my understanding. It's not like I, to, I said to myself, I want to stop smoking. I didn't have any such uh, inclination. I, I quite enjoyed my cigarettes, actually. <laughs> but, uh, um, but suddenly my body was completely reject rejecting them. I was sleeping less, and there was like an intuitive force within me that just came up to the surface where in my fourth year of college, which was the year following uh, the year I did the program, even though all my classmates were like really spending a lot of time thinking and uh, a lot of mental and uh, effort to put together the final project together, it felt like my final project just kind of emerged to the surface from a very effortless source. And I was feeling healthier. I was, uh, you know, I lost weight. I was um, more vibrant. I could I've, I've always been someone who exercises, but it felt like my lung capacity was limitless. And uh, above all, it just gave me a totally different perspective on life um, that I always had a question about, but that, uh, that I never knew as to how to access. So suddenly I was looking at everything around me as this vibrant, throbbing life, and nothing was boring anymore. There was no room for boredom anymore. So after my graduation, I just kind of wanted to go to India and see what the yoga center looks like there. It was a two-month visit, and the space there is phenomenal. The people I saw there, you know, I, I never imagined that human beings could be like that, that they could be so gentle, so graceful, at the same time, so active and vibrant and so sharp. So, you know, there was always a misunderstanding in my mind that people who are spiritual are boring <laughs> and <laughs> dull and uninteresting. But, you know, I was, uh, I saw people who were as intense sitting with their eyes closed as they were playing a ball game in the middle of the field. Um, so it just brought my attention that there is a different way of living and being that I was very eager to uh, go deeper into. And that's when I started doing further advanced programs and in 2006, so I did my first program in 2004, and in 2006, uh, another war exploded in Lebanon, which was a one-month war, uh, and I was already, you know, doing some advanced practices uh, that I learned with Isha, um, and this is when, in the month of August, after the war, uh, you know, uh, subsided, that I really saw that uh, you can do many attempts to change humanity, but the only thing that will work is uh, if individual human beings change, which is something that I had heard Sadhguru speak.